Right, it looks like the participant numbers are kind of leveling off now, so we'll just get started. Um, so hello, um, my name is Joanna. I work at the Montrose Basin Visitor Centre for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And um, welcome to our first ever online wild goose watch. Um, and thank you to players of People's Postcode Lottery for supporting this event. Um, this event is being recorded, so uh, it'll be available to watch on the Trust's YouTube channel after the event. And a few things to go over before we switch over to the live stream. Um, you'll see in the little toolbar at the bottom of the screen, um, there's a Q&A tab. So if anyone has any questions at any point, please just click on the Q&A tab and you can ask any questions and I'll be aiming to answer those throughout the evening. Um, and the chat tab as well. So I see some people have already found the chat tab. Um, thank you very much for welcoming me. Um, please just post any comments into this uh, chat area um, and just don't post any links in the chat if that's okay with you. Um, so I think the kind of setup for this evening is that we're gonna switch between me at Montrose Basin Visitor Center and our lovely team of volunteers that are currently out on the reserve um, doing the live stream of the geese. So it'll be a mixture of the two. Um, but my, I think if we could switch to the live stream now, and we'll show you what the view is like at the moment. So this is a beautiful view of sunset over Montrose Basin. There aren't any geese yet but I'm hoping that I can hear the calls of some just coming. So you can actually hear the calls of some of the pink-footed geese already. So that's a good sign. And we're very happy that we seem to be getting a bit of a sunset tonight as well. So a little introduction about the pink-footed geese before some questions come in. Um, the Montrose Basin is internationally important for pink -footed. You can see some of them there in the distance. That's um, our volunteers zooming right in on them. So we're internationally important for pink-footed geese. They migrate to the Montrose Basin in the autumn time from the from Iceland and Greenland. So this is mainly the Icelandic population of pink um, And it's late September that they start to arrive. You can see in the distance there that that's some of the pink-footed geese. They are kind of a medium-sized goose. Um, they gray, they're kind of grazers. So, um, they will feed in fields during the day and they come back to the basin. So you get the best views of them at Montrose Basin at either early morning when they're all taking off to feed or the evening when they're coming back to the basin to roost overnight because it's a nice safe place to be. We really like this area of the reserve um, because there's a little light, uh, a little fresh water stream that comes into the, into the basin at this section. Um, someone is asking whereabouts on the basin is the live stream taking place? I won't give away the exact location, um, but our volunteers are placed on the side of the basin that's closest to the town. So we send people over to Ayok. Um, it's this area of the basin that's um, nice reclaimed land that used to be historically the rubbish tip of Montrose, but has now been transformed into um, forest. And um, so it's this new regenerating forest um, just by Montrose. And it's where the geese usually come in to roost. So that's where we are. Um, 
Adam, age six, is asking, how long do the geese stay in Montrose? Um, it's a very good question. So they start to arrive um, from usually middle of September and they, they breed up in Iceland and then they come down to Scotland um, in mid-September and they'll stay with us in the UK at least until um, March the next year. So they'll stay with us for the whole winter. Um, they usually will be in Scotland until about October when they start, until about November when they start to head further south and um, when the day length gets shorter. So you see a really nice sunset developing now. Um, so the geese stay in Montrose, I would say the 80,000 geese stay in Montrose from, for just a couple months. They, they tend to move further south into England, like Norfolk, um, as the day length gets worse. But around 10,000 will stay on the Montrose Basin the whole time um, and before they head back up to the Iceland um, in March. Um, I'm being told that there's some geese arriving on the basin. I'll maybe be quiet for a little bit and we'll just watch the geese coming in and then I'll answer some more questions. I've also been told that um, there's one goose amongst the few geese that have already arrived in the basin. There haven't been many that have arrived yet. Apparently, one of them is a leucistic goose, which is um, when geese are partially white. I'm going to be quiet because I can hear geese. Now I'm very pleased that we've gotten some footage of this. So what you just saw just now called whiffling. So this is when pink-footed geese, um, when they're coming into the basin to kind of control their landing, they'll suddenly flip their wings sideways so they lose all of the lift from underneath their wings. So even though it looks like they're totally chaotically out of control, um, they're actually controlling their descent sort of adjusting their, their height in the air so that they can land nicely on the base and exactly where they wanted to land. So it looks like they're out of control, but actually they're very sensible. That was called whiffling. So that's a nice little scheme that just came in. Um, it's a really nice sunset that we're getting as well. getting lots of questions coming in now. So before the next scheme comes in, I'll try and answer a couple. Um, right. Fiona asks, why do geese fly in a V shape? Oh, Miriam, age six, asks, why do geese fly in a V shape? That's also a really good question. So it's not fully known why geese fly in a V shape. And actually, at Montrose, because we get so many, so a record number of pink food, 90,000. Um, when we get these massive numbers all at once, they really don't make these anymore. They make lots of other letters of the alphabet. So sometimes it'll just be a cloud. Sometimes um, they make W's or, or Anyway, they make the classic V shape, probably because of aerodynamics. So essentially, that's at the front of the V is doing the most work are behind the wings of the front one are 
getting to use the lift from the sort of vortexes of the wings from the earth. So it's energy saving. It saves them energy because they can lift from the juice. Of the earth. So. You'll sometimes see other birds making V shapes as well, but it really is key to the way. Just about here, some more pink footed geese coming in. So hopefully, we'll get a massive spin soon. Um, oh, oh, and yes, Anne, you're right, they do take turns to leave. Sometimes, we'll um, keep changing the sort of leader of the team um, and often injured or unwell geese will take place the back. They don't have to use so much energy. That's a good amount of geese building up in the distance there. Um, so just for an idea of the amount that are on the basin, at least that we might be expecting to come onto the basin um, today. On, oh, and that's the leucistic goose. <laughs> Can you see that white goose um, in the middle of that gaggle of geese in the distance? That is the partially leucistic goose, which means that genetically a bit paler than the rest. But that's nice. You often see those. Kind of like al albinism, like albino, but not totally lacking pigment. Um, so we have, on Friday, we had just about 52,000 pink footed in basin. So on Friday morning, our ranger counted 50. So hopefully, I build up in numbers soon. Um, our age five asks, why do pink footed geese have pink feet? I'm not sure why they have pink feet. Um, their Latin name does come from the fact that they have pink feet, though, which really annoys me. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but they're Latin name translates to pink beaked. Um, and they do have pink beaks as well as pink feet. But um, they probably have pink feet just because it's the way it seemed to evolve and it didn't, um, there wasn't anything selecting against it. So um, gray legs kind of have pinkish feet. Hear some whistling in now, so we can watch those. So we've chosen to put our online wild goose watch on an evening when there's a low tide, because you'll find that they like to land on the mud flats. But the Montrose Basin is intertidal, so that means earlier today, when we were actually at the same spot looking for a good place to set up the camera. This was all water, um, and the geese actually like to come in a bit closer when the mud flats are there. So um, they like it because it saves energy. You don't have to sit on the water all night. Um, so Michael asks, do they come in every evening, even if the tide is high? Um, so that kind of relates to what I was talking about. Um, yes, they will. Um, the only times they don't really come to the basin when the weather has been so stormy and wet that the fields that they're feeding in during the day are flooded anyway. Um, and they just, it's too windy for it to be worth their effort to come back to the basin. Um, so they will come in at high tide though, um, if the weather's okay. It's still a safe place. Um, you'll just see them all sitting on the water instead. You still see that leucistic amongst the rest of them. Right. 
Uh, Craig asks, what attracts the geese to Montrose? That's them taking off again. Sometimes the geese will readjust their position on the mud flats. If anything spooks them, um, they will move about on the mud flats quite a lot. So it's nice seeing them all lifting off and then landing again. But yes, Craig asks what attracts the geese to controls. Um, the geese like to roost on estuaries, um, so they feed on, at least nowadays, pink-footed geese mainly will feed um, in the UK on like post-harvest fields. So Montrose is really good because Angus is, there's a lot of agriculture in Angus. So the basin is essentially surrounded by farmers' fields. And they like to eat spilt grain um, and any sort of po post-harvest crop. Um, so they come to the Montrose Basin because it's an estuary that's really, really large as well. So um, in recent years it's become the place in the UK that can have the highest amount of the Icelandic population of geese at any one time. So last year we had just over 11% of the entire Icelandic population of pink-footed geese on the basin at once. But we can have more than that sometimes. Um, the Icelandic population of geese is about 500,000 now. Um, and we can get up to 90,000. So we can sometimes have almost a, uh, almost a fifth of the whole population of Icelandic geese, Icelandic pink-footed geese. Let's watch these coming in and I'll answer some of those. Watch for the whistling. <laughs> I haven't really had a giant skiing land in on the basin yet at sea. Um, apparently the wind is getting a bit stronger. Um, so sometimes it'll depend as well on, on what fields they've been feeding in during the day. So we'll see if we get any big skiings coming in. Um, Laura asks, do the geese ever sleep or do they honk 24 seven? Um, first of all, I think that the geese don't really honk. So kind of associate geese with honking. I would say the pink foot of geese might make more of a wink wink sound and it's honking that is left Canada geese, grey lag geese. Um, but they do sleep, but you'll just hear them talking to each other all the time because it tends to be like a few sentries. Um, so they'll all be en masse roosting on the basin overnight, but there'll be one take, they'll take it in turns to sort of be on the lookout, kind of like meerkats. Um, so they do sleep, but they take it in turns. And there's kind of just the constant sound of them chattering to each other every night in Montrose during this time of year. number in the distance now. Um, 
Anne says that she's heard them on the 23rd of September and noted that she'd heard them on exactly the same day last year. What kind of window do you expect their arrival? Um, it's quite normal to see them arriving around the same date um, years in a row. We usually say the middle of September is when we get the pink food. So 23rd is pretty good. We're actually kind of late this year. Um, they arrived kind of on the second um, last year, but this year it was the 19th. So it's usually in September at some point. It's all to do with what the wind's doing. With the wind is against them the whole time. Um, so the wind is kind of like a wind from the south, then it will be difficult for them to get from Iceland to Scotland. So they, they usually um, will see that until the wind direction is perfect for them. Very beautiful sunset. I hope I'm answering these questions in order. Lawrence, age five, asks, what do the geese eat and where do they find the food? Kind of um, answered that earlier, but yes, they eat. Well, when they're in Iceland, um, they eat any sort of vegetable that they can find. So they're herbivores and they'll um, they live in sort of tundra up in Iceland, so they'll just root around for roots. And when they come to Scotland, they'll feed on milks and they'll feed on leftover potatoes and grain. And, but they're they're opportunists. They'll just eat whatever kind of herbivorous food they can. Then age 12 asks, are there Canada geese or grey lag geese? It looks at the moment like we're only seeing pink-footed geese on the reserve, but we did have um, about a thousand Canada geese earlier this year and a few hundred grey lags. But once the pink-footed geese start arriving, the other kind of move away. Overwhelming the number of other sorts. So. Um, Martin asks, How long do they take to fly from Iceland to you? Do they stop over anywhere? Um, so, it depends again on the wind speed and the wind direction. Sometimes they'll stop off at the Falkland Islands before they move on to Scotland but it can take them just six hours to get to the Falkland Islands and then just another about a day. So depending on the route they take, it really just takes them a day and a bit, or even a day if they're lucky with the wind speed. So yeah, they'll sometimes stop off at Falkland Islands, but quite often we hear about them getting reported at other estuaries north of us before we start to see them coming in at Montrose. So sometimes Loch of Strathbeg will get a few before. So there's lots of stopover points. Montrose Basin is a stopover point. Um, oh, I did mean the Faroe Islands. Thank you. I meant the Faroe Islands. They stop off at the Faroe Islands and then move down to Montrose. Um, they the Montrose Basin is also a stop off point, so we'll stop off here and then move further south. Working Bay and the wash in Norfolk as it gets colder. Yes, so the geese roost on the basin overnight, but they during the day they go to lots of surrounding fields. Here's a nice, um, lovely stream coming. Um, 
fun fact about the word scheme that it's come for, it comes from um, scheme being used to refer to a length of yarn. So it's like a little length of yarn. You might see some whiffling action in here. You'll notice it's quite windy tonight. You can keep it picking up on the audio, but you're loud enough that you can hear it. You'll notice they always seem to land where there's already other geese. Very um, pretty. They like to be together. Um, Isabel asks how far they travel during the day. Um, they can they can go to quite far away fields. It just depends on where the food is. Sometimes. Um, St. Cyrus is a village just north of the Trove in Aberdeenshire. Sometimes they're feeding all in those fields. And then they'll come back to the basin, but sometimes they'll feed right close to the basin. And so they can go quite a ways, a few miles. And estimate how many geese there are? That's a really good question. So the Montrose Basin Ranger um, who works with um, another ranger who works for Angus Alive, the ranger service for the Angus Council. They've been working at Montrose Basin for so long that they can make a bunch of geese and estimate. Well, that's 1,000, so that's 2,000, so that's 10,000. So, we've gotten very good at looking at a big number of geese. Um, so they can estimate 52,000 because they count them at dawn. At dawn, the people have just roosted on the basin overnight and they'll take off um, in the morning time. So they'll count them at dawn because they can count the sort of big flocks of them on the mud. And then as they take off, they know they're not double counting them. It's kind of easier to count geese when they're in the sky than when they're on the mud as well. So we estimate it from adding together lots of different. But we also have more accurate counts a few times a year. So there's a team of volunteers who will be stationed at different points around the basin um, at dawn. And they'll count the geese as they take off over their heads. Um, so if you ever see a number that's much more specific than about 52,000, um, the Icelandic goose census kind of counts. other types of geese mixed in with the pink footed geese? We do. Um, we've already had quite a few Brent geese, well, 22 Brent geese, um, which isn't very much compared to the tens of thousands of pinkies. Um, but we'll sometimes get some other rare geese mixed in. So we usually will see a few white fronted goose um, geese um, most years. Um, sometimes some barnacle geese, which are much more common at other reserves. Um, and 
one year, it was either 2019 or 2018, one of our colleagues was um, speaking with Michaela Strachan for the Autumn Watch feature that they did on Montrose Basin. Um, and he found a snow goose in amongst all the pink-footed geese one morning. Um, and that hasn't happened again since, so it, it must have known that uh, the Autumn Watch were coming to film them. So. We've turned down the volume a little bit on the live stream camera just because the wind was getting quite noisy. Um, but we'll turn it back up again if it gets a bit a bit more sheltered again. But you can see the numbers are really building up now. It looks like our cameraman is trying to focus in on a scheme that's just arriving. It's maybe a bit too zoomed in. Oh, there we go. I think he found them. So this is the time of the evening where we can get massive schemes all at once. Here's some really good numbers coming in. And you can really see the whiffling in action there. See how they move their wings to the side so they totally drop out of the sky for a second. That's them controlling their descent. Right. Um, Alison asks, if there are 90,000 geese, it must get very crowded on the shoreline when the tide comes in. Yes, but the geese don't really tend to stick to the mudflats. At the moment, they're on the mudflats because they're there. Um, but unlike other birds that roost on the basin, they will just swim on the water um, when the tide comes in. So the other day at the visitor centre, we saw what we thought was a landmass in the distance on the basin, but it was actually just a landmass of geese. Um, about 20,000 just gathered up together. Um, Wendy's saying that she loves the sound, so maybe we should send a message through to our volunteer team to put the noise up a little bit. We've asked the audio to go back up a little bit. Um, okay, I'm not answering these questions in any sort of order, I'm sorry. Um, Lisa says, I always thought the term roosting referred to birds habit of doing so up in trees or in shelters. Is there a special word for birds that collect along shorelines or at sea level? Um, we still just use the word roost. Um, there's lots of, we call them high tide roosts around the basin. Um, so the basin is also home to thousands of other birds, um, a lot of wading birds. So like red shank and green shank and dunlin and knot. Um, and there's a high tide roost. Um, there's lots of different high tide roosts all around the basin. Um, so we call them roosts still. Um, it's the same word that we use. Um, Dorothy, aged nine, asks, do the geese have any predators? It's a good question. They have some really interesting predators because they also live up in Iceland and Greenland. Um, so I think, I think they could even have polar bears as a predator. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, but in the UK, I suppose a fox would sometimes go for pink-footed geese, but they're in such high numbers um, that it would probably have to be an injured or unwell pink-footed goose that would get picked off by a fox. Um,
It's a very beautiful sunset there. I like the sunsets at low tide because you get the reflections on the mud flats as well as the water. So it seems that they're coming in to roost at lots of different sections of the mud flats. So um, our camera crew are doing a good job of keeping track of all the different different flocks of them. There's some coming in. Got a lot of whiffling action tonight, I'm glad. We thought with the wind, it seems likely. It's like they need to manually control their descent more when there's lots of um, wind getting in the way. Um, Andrea asks if they stay in mate pairs when they travel and roost. I think there's some evidence that they'll stay in family groups. Um, so when they're breeding in Iceland, they'll typically have kind of three to five eggs in a brood. So they can have a little family unit. Um, and sometimes those will stick together, especially if there are some recently hatched ones in the group. But it would be difficult to, to know that for sure. Um, Petra asks, what type of fields do geese graze in? Why certain fields and not others? I don't think they're too picky. I think they really go for whichever ones have got the most food in them. Um, so they'll kind of, um, they'll feed on recently, um, recently harvested fields. Uh, Freddie, you're right, yes, people also prey on geese. Um, and you're right, good point, crows and snakes will take their eggs up in Iceland as well. Here's a nice scheme coming in. There's the whiffling again. So you can totally see the numbers building up now. It's been a bit more gradual tonight um, than other nights. Just kind of depends on what fields they've been feeding in. If every if all of the geese have been feeding in the same area, sometimes you can get this mass um, influx of geese all of within the space of about 20 minutes. But it seems like we're getting a nice drawn out sunset. Craig is asking if we can get more volume from the basin. We will, we will ask our camera crew to increase the volume. It's not too windy for them. Um, oh, someone's asked what what other birds are settling. Um, there, yes, there are oyster catchers and shell duck. I think I saw some mallard earlier as well. The gulls will probably be herring gulls, maybe some black headed gulls. And we do also have a few great black backed gulls, and we occasionally get lesser black backed gulls as well. Um, Last year, we actually had a pair of spoonbills in amongst the pink-footed geese. So if you hear closely, you never know. We're getting the good numbers in there.
we're very lucky in Montrose that we're surrounded by water because it means we can um we can get sunsets over the basin over the water and we get sunrises over the sea. We'll have to let the camera crew know that the camera work is being complimented at the moment. Seems like the, the bigger numbers of geese are starting to flood in now, so that's good. Let's see if I can find some more questions to answer. Um, someone's asks, ask, do they call to each other in flight? Is that so that they know the position of everyone in the group? They do call to each other a lot in flight. Um, it's kind of, it's mostly, yeah, contact calling. It's just to um, make sure they're all there um, and accounted for. You will see that they'll speak to each other more when it's foggy. So because the Montrose Basin is right next to the sea, it means we get a lot of har. Um, and that means that we have lots of mornings where you can't really see very much. So the geese talk to each other a lot just to be like, are you still there? Um, so yeah, it's contact calls. Colors are so nice there. And um, someone has asked, does the entire Icelandic population come to the UK? Um, yes, pretty much. Um, so you get the Greenland and Iceland population coming down to the UK. I think sometimes they'll end up in Denmark as well. So kind of. Um, other European countries. Mainly, um, it's the Svalbard population of pink footed geese that will work their way down the sort of Scandinavian coast, go down to Denmark. Very nice and set. Alice asks Do the geese tend to get on harmoniously with the other kinds of birds that are already on the basin when they arrive? Yeah. I would say that apart from the other geese kind of disappearing when the other when the pink footed geese arrive, yeah, I don't think that um, I don't think it puts off um, other species very much at all. Um, they must notice though. You'd think they must notice. It gets a lot noisier. So the light's definitely fading a little now, but it seems that we're getting some nice sunset colours, so hopefully we'll get the, the silhouettes of the geese coming in. Alan asks if pink footed geese pair for life. I don't quite know the answer to that one. Um, I'm sure there's some studies on it, though I'll have to find the answer to that one. I would say probably like a lot of birds where even if it seems they're monogamous, they might not be completely monogamous. So this little freshwater stream that you can see, um, this is a little burn that comes in at Taic, um, through from Montrose. And this is one of the reasons why the geese like to roost on this part of the basin is because they like this freshwater stream. They like to have it there to have a drink or to have a wash. Um, they'll sometimes come in closer if you're watching the geese coming in, even though they're all quite far away at the moment. Sometimes they'll fly in just to come to the stream for a bit. coming in. 
So see what I mean about the V shape just kind of dissolving? Um, I guess that could be a V. But once the whiffling starts, it just totally so we're getting a good demonstration of whiffling here. Um, whiffling, if someone didn't catch it before, is when the geese will suddenly change their wings. Um, so they'll be flying straight and then they'll suddenly lift their wings. So it's like a, a what would the name be? Perpendicular angle. Um, and they'll, they'll lose all the lift from their wings all at once. So you'll just suddenly see them flip their wings, drop, and then readjust themselves again. Um, so that's called whiffling and it's so they can control their descent. Very good at it. That's exactly where they wanted to land. Mm -hmm. Ely asks if the geese return to exactly the same place to feed every day. Um, no, no, they'll, they'll sometimes choose a different field, but sometimes there's a field right opposite the visitor center and sometimes they'll feed in that one for a few days um, and then move on to a different field um, later on. Um, I don't know if they tell each other where the best place is to go though. I think um, they must just kind of search every day um, or remember that there was still food there. Um, when they're taking off in the morning again. Nice silhouette of the Angus Glens now. Um, current temperature at the basin, Ooh, getting a bit colder these days. It might be down to maybe 12 degrees now. Maybe a bit colder. Um, Pink-footed geese, if they were feeding in a field, um, historically they sort of gain a knowledge of which fields were safe for feeding in. Um, so they will sometimes return to the same fields year on year if they know it was safe for them. Anne asks what they feed on. They feed um, on sort of post-harvest crops, so broken potatoes and spilt grain, leftover wheat and grass and things. Um, and a lot of people are asking if that causes a problem for farmers. Mostly, I'm not a farmer, so there might be differing opinions. Mostly, I don't so much because they're, they're typically feeding on post-harvest fields. So the harvest has already happened and then they're just feeding on the leftovers. Um, and it's similar. Oh, here's a good scheme. Similar when they go further south to England, they'll feed on sugar beet fields. Um, and at the end of the season, that's just the leftover stuff they're feeding on, but it becomes a problem when we're coming back into spring again and they start feeding on the new growth and that's when it's a problem.
just had word from camera crew that there's thousands coming in now, so this must be the flux we were waiting for. While they're landing to add on to um, what I was saying earlier. Um, some farmers will use techniques to make sure geese don't feed on specific fields for too long. They're very flighty, so really you just have to go in and wave your arms and they'll take off. So steer crows or um, just a bit of disturbance. Here's the clouds we were waiting for. Apparently, Thousands are coming in from all directions, so I'll just be quiet for a bit and we can watch the spectacle. This will be the tens of thousands now.
thought I would check back in now that that giant cloud has settled down a little bit. So if people weren't reading the comments, our volunteer team reckon that's about 30,000 geese in front of you at the moment. Um, but there's masses more elsewhere on the basin. This is just where the highest concentration is. It's my colleague saying they're um, trying to look for speed in the west end of the basin. Then. try and get through some more questions. We're all quite moved by that performance. Very good. Mike asks what determines the size of a scheme. Um, I think after seeing that, we can agree that there's definitely an upper limit on a scheme. I don't know if I would really describe that as a scheme anymore. It's more like a amazing swarm. Um, I don't think there's any official definition of the size of the scheme. It's more come. Um, I would say you need enough geese to make a bee. Apparently there's still geese coming in from the east, so we might get another one of those spectacles in which King Sol we are definitely losing light now. I think that's a red shank making itself in a wind. Red shank and green shank can sound really similar, but so this is what happens when you watch the geese come in at Montrose Basin, as you think that must be all of them, but then suddenly a whole another cloud of them appears. And this can keep happening even once all the light is lost. So you can find yourself um, on the edge of the basin and suddenly it's completely dark and you have to make your way back to the car. We've heard a lot of the sounds of the pink footed geese now, you can tell that they make this wink wink sound much more of a wink wink in Hong Kong. David's asking about why there weren't any geese at Aberlady the other day. Um, probably just the movement of the geese. We've noticed it's been a bit unusual this year. Um, apparently, some of the geese have already arrived in Scotland, have already moved on to the Solway River, um, which is earlier than usual. So it will probably be to do with wind direction. Some of them might have skipped you or might have uh, you might be waiting for the next influx of things. That happens to us as well. Um, we'll certainly have much less geese because the wind direction was perfect for them to just head further south. It was better further south. Usually to do with where the food is. So. Bill asks roughly how many pink footed geese come through this area each year. Um, we, the peak count that we get at Montrose Basin is usually, this time, usually nowadays it's about 80,000 is our usual peak. Highest ever has been 90,000, but that's a snapshot. So overall we get more than that. 
because they need an answer to stop or before they need to bring themselves to walk to the bay or wash Norfolk or any other sort of um, little estuaries further south. Um, they we're getting a snapshot of these geese that are moving through, but we get a huge proportion of the roughly 500,000 um, Icelandic goose, Icelandic food goose population. 80,000 is our peak number, but we'll get, I would imagine, all in all, across the sea, we we'll get 100. They will still land in the dark in the winter time because over winter we can have 10,000 um, that stay on the basin throughout the winter. Um, they need to get quite good at night flying because Scottish winter time is almost entirely dark. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they can still land in the dark. It's a very good vision or they just use contact calls a lot to um, make sure they're all together. So the camera crew are saying things are getting very cold. Light is fading. We might receive word from them that they might want to wrap up soon. That happens and they can stick around for a bit longer. And Answer any more questions if you need. Here's another scheme for you. I don't think the geese have any crash landings. I think um, with their whiffling techniques, uh, they managed to control their flight quite well, but I'm sure there's been a, the occasional less landing. I've never seen a crash landing. like the, the live streaming team are okay to tough it out. The light is still good. Um, Avril asks, do geese get injured in this mass influx? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but naturally injuries can happen. And sometimes during the daytime when we're running the visitor center. Sometimes that's just older geese or ones that are a bit injured. But it doesn't, I don't think it happens. It really doesn't happen. Um, the flight over from Iceland can take a day and a bit. So sometimes they'll stop off at the Faroe Islands and that takes them about six hours to get there. And then they come further south to us and that takes them just under a day. So it takes them about a, about a day and a bit. And they go back to Iceland in March, April. It's more imperceptible when the geese are making the migration back up to Iceland. We don't really get this huge influx like we do um, when they're coming in. But usually by by April, we've, we've lost them all. They're back in, um, back in their breeding grounds. And their final destination, um, is usually the wash in Norfolk. I'm sure there's some places a bit further south. The visitor centre is open all year. Um, so the visitor centre is currently open five days a week from Thursday through to Monday, half 10 till five. And from the 1st of November, we go on to our winter hours and we're closed on Thursdays as well. So we're open four days a week in winter. If you go onto our website, um, on the Scottish Wildlife Trust page. You can find the Montrose Basin page through there and we've got all our opening times there. Love to see you. Here. If anyone's interested in learning more about the geese and more about the other wildlife of the basin, like ospreys in summer, kingfishers in winter, um, come to the visitor centre. We've got lots of experienced staff and volunteers that would be happy to um, help you out. We can have really nice views as well. You get amazing views of the birds from here. 
Um, Anna asks where the baby geese are born. The geese are born in Iceland, yes. Um, Bigfoot geese don't breed in the UK, they breed up in Iceland and Greenland and Svalbard. Very sorry if I've missed any questions. There's just been so many coming through. Apparently there's still some more pink-footed geese coming in, even though we're losing so much light, they're still coming in. Thank you for all the nice thank yous. It's pretty dark in the basin now, so this might be a quite natural stopping point. Um, it'll be pretty much black before we know it, so. We might have to do one last sweeping view of the basin before, before our volunteer team get get hypothermia. <laughs> I'll, I'll make them um I'll make sure they, they get all your thank yous as well. Well if anyone wants to see this spectacle for themselves please pop us an email or um come to the visitor center and we'll tell you how you can experience this for yourself in person. Oh yeah, I should pass on your thank yous to the, the geeks as well, because you're right, they, they did their part too. I think we're, we're going to pan back to the sunset and then we'll um, end the event, I think. Thank you all so much for coming. It's been good, our first ever live online event. I'm glad it's gone well. Sorry again for the, the link confusion. I'm glad you guys managed to make it in. we can see some of you in person soon. And for the many questions I missed, please don't be shy, just send them through to our Facebook or our Twitter um, or email them to us or give us a phone. Um, all of our contact details are on Scottish Wildlife Trust Montrose Bay website. So we're always here. You can answer anything that I missed out. That's our end shot now. So um, thank you everyone for coming. 